Hello, I'm Extension Risk and Business Management Specialist, Matt Dearson. The Every Acre Counts program grew out of concerns over soil health and its implications for farmers, wildlife, and the region as a whole. We gathered a few key partners of the program together with Anthony Bly to discuss how Every Acre Counts got started, what it is trying to do, and what the future may hold. My name is Anthony Bly. I'm a soils field specialist with SDSU Extension. Um, I've been with uh, the university for almost 30 years and had a couple different roles with soil fertility research. Uh, but lately my extension role has been really focusing on soil health and, uh, and, and a co-coordinator of the Every Acre Counts program. I'm Matt Morlock. I'm the state coordinator for South Dakota and North Dakota. Um, <clears throat> my job and responsibility is to work with partners and set up programs for the company. Um, and also managing staff, but that's not important today. Um, really, it said work with producers, work with landowners and partners to develop programs that make sense on the landscape. Um, ultimately for us, Upland Habitat is our goal and mission, but so many times we find out that it's actually just working with producers and helping them get to where they want to be and doing things that are great for their property um, and wildlife comes along with that. So that's my roles and responsibilities with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. My name is Jim Ristow. I'm the Director of Sustainability for South Dakota Corn. It was a position created in partnership with NRCS to see if uh, we could deliver common mission, especially when it comes to things like conservation and land use uh, between farmers and, uh, and uh, conservation and, and uh, other interests like non-gain non wildlife people as well, things like monarch butterflies and, and uh, habitat. Um, so I uh, work with all these folks and, and try to come up with good common sense solutions to some of these issues that we deal with. My name's Kevin Roebling. I'm the department secretary with the South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. You know, the department's mission is to serve, connect, and manage. Uh, serving and connecting people and families to the outdoors through responsible management, through effective management of our state parks, fisheries, and wildlife resources. The vision of the department, and it's a real simple one, is to enhance the quality of life for current and future generations. So really what this comes down to is it's twofold. We want to make sure that farming and ranching is profitable. We want to make sure they're very profitable because they're the, the keepers of the wildlife. They're the ones that are providing that wildlife habitat, and habitat is the foundation of wildlife management. In order for all of these outdoor activities to occur, especially in the hunting realm of the world, we need landowners, we need producers, and we need producers to continue carrying on that, you know, that tradition of, of ensuring that they're taking care of the lands to the best of their abilities. And that's what I'm here for. That's what my passion is, is agriculture and profitability and connecting that with conservation and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And so we just want to have a discussion today uh, about the program and so let's let's look back uh, first of all let's look where we've come from. Um, let's go maybe back 30 years, 20 years. Um, let's think about what South Dakota was then. I think we can all think back that far can't we? Yeah. In a way, okay, we kind of know. Um, What's changed? What's changed on the landscape today? What, how has South Dakota changed and, and why are we here talking about every acre counts today? Anybody have a first comment that comes to mind? Well, I can certainly speak to what we've seen in agriculture. Um, you know, as, as um, yields increase due to good genetics, better genetics, a lot of technology, a lot of systems, scientific approaches to agriculture, uh, the uh, efficiencies increased and as well as an expansion into acres where we were taking these new systems and with some success and things like no-till farming became uh, common and now it allowed us to do some more things rather than all the tillage. We brought in more chemistry to deal with problems. Um, all of these things are changes that, that came and, and had a major impact across the state. It's allowed uh, maybe some uh, more focused uh, approaches to certain crops like corn and soybeans, replacing acres of wheat, barley, flax, hay, some of those other things. So 
maybe a little loss of diversity or a lot of loss of diversity in some landscapes where these, uh, these other approaches which are very profitable uh, came, came along. So along with that maybe some expansion in farm size as people adopted those changes mm -hmm. and uh, it became tougher and tougher for the smaller farm to compete in that and, and uh, we probably saw some uh, you know, fewer people in the rural landscape because of it. Go ahead. Yeah, to kind of elaborate on that, I mean, some of the technological advancements have just been incredible over the last 30 years in agriculture. Um, you know, we have technology changing each and every day, and, and some of that technology then allows us to do more precision agriculture, precision ag, regenerative ag. It's, it's a common thing that producers now are looking at every single acre of those fields. They're looking at all the input costs, what they're putting into those acres, and what they can get out of those acres in a more data analytic, analytical way. And I think that's really changed through the years. When I sat in a combine when I was 12, we didn't have all those tools and techniques and computers and the yield monitors and that data and information at our fingertips like we do today. So it has allowed us to change our farming practices. And I think that's where the Every Acre Counts concept was really formed. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to kind of finish building off of that, you know, something that we've seen a lot of is commodity prices go up and down as, you know, either weather conditions or technology changes. Um, and so you have producers that are chasing those highs and, and as they do that, then we have less habitat on the ground. And then commodity prices go down and we get more habitat on the ground. And, you know, what, you know, with every accounts, kind of what we're looking at is showing that it's always sustainably profitable to do conservation, to kind of get rid of those peaks and valleys and chasing it, because as, you know, habitat comes and goes, and as more cropland, less cropland comes and goes, our wildlife populations fluctuate too. Um, and we really feel like there's a happy medium that, where it makes sense profitability-wise for producers um, to be putting habitat in the ground and having it there long-term and keeping it on the ground, and this is a way to demonstrate that. So you kind of alluded to the fact, Matt, of, of, of these areas of these fields, and Kevin touched on that as well, these areas of these fields that we can identify now. Um, you know, we talk about them as marginal lands. Um, so let's just, let's just review that a little bit over the last 20, 20, 30 years. What has changed on the landscape? Um, you know, we can have that discussion about, about the, the photos that we have on the banner behind us about the different types of, 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 of lands that have kind of gotten worse, in a sense, if yeah. you will. And that's, you know, that's a, you know, the salinity issue in our state, especially that James River Valley. That's where South Dakota Corn and Pheasant Forever started working together the most was with that single issue. Um, as water regimes have changed on the landscape and less water is being used, um, we see things like salinity popping up, and that you know has dramatic effects on producers' yields. Um, and they're all, they're trying to get the most they can out of it, and they continue to farm them even though it's a lost cause in a lot of cases. Um, so issues like that have seen a lot of increase in salinity, um, which really hits producers' pocketbooks and hits communities on Main Street. Um, so that's like I said, where Jim and I started working together in South Dakota Corn and PF. Um, on that issue, because it was just one of those things that was really obvious that there was there was something going on there. So these areas and these fields have become salty. You've all witnessed that. Um, that that's a that's a combination of a lot of different factors, isn't it? Yeah, um, and we we invested in a lot of research, uh, South Dakota Corn and SDSU, and there's been a lot of work done studying the issue. What are the causes? What are the solutions? I mean, our are things what what are the things we can do to remediate that and and one of the best solutions is to put a perennial back into that landscape well that went right in line with what uh, you know we'd like to see as from the habitat point of view as well mm -hmm. is is just a perennial grass is good for most wildlife species and if this acre isn't really producing in a profitable manner that now with, with a precision approach to taking a look at this, we can identify those acres uh, much better in the past than just saying, well, let's see what happens. We have the tools and technology to do much better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, 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 let's take that snapshot of the last 30 years, what we just talked about, the changes in practices, the effect on the land. And I really would like to touch on how has the wildlife habitat been affected negatively, positively, um, 
and I think you're in a position to really, really discuss some of those things, Kevin. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it depends on where you're talking. You know, the, the geographic proximity, the distribution of the habitat across South Dakota has changed. Some, some of it's changed more than others, but if you look back in the early 2000s, we had 1.8 million acres of CRP in South Dakota. Today we're just over 900,000 acres, so that has changed. I mean, we cut the number of CRP acres in half. Um, does CRP offer incredible wildlife habitat? There's no doubt about it, but what it also offers is soil health. It offers water quality, you know, aspects. Uh, there's, there's many benefits to CRP, but ultimately this is more about the producer. This is more about making the producer profitable. The byproduct is the perennial grass, which the byproduct of those perennial grasses then is the wildlife component. And I ultimately believe that's how we get there, is not so much relying so heavily on federal programs and, and that sort of thing, but relying on the farming practice in itself to incorporate these perennial grasses into, you know, a field, a 160 acre field, maybe it's only 20 acres of that field that are, you know, net loss acres in a sense that uh, go back into perennial grass, but that is going to definitely benefit uh, mul multiple things and not just the soil, not just the, the water that's you know, around that soil, but also the wildlife that's on top of that soil. We know why we're here today to talk about the Every Acre Counts program and I think we've, we've developed a great foundation leading up to uh, the beginnings of the of the Every Acre Counts program, but let's just uh, let's just talk with the folks a little bit about what the background of Every Acre Counts has been. Um, I look to you three as 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 being that foundation for that that kind of idea. But let's just let's just uh, maybe talk a little bit about the background of the program first. Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> as I remember it, <laughs> back, we back in the day. Yeah. Well, it was kind of uh, two things were going on. There was a lot of concern about making, you know, what could we do for habitat in the state of South Dakota, and there was also uh, an effort to develop the Precision Ag uh, program at SDSU and put up a building and, and get that whole thing off the ground. It was happening during the Dugard administration, and and. Uh, that's about the time that uh, you know the the uh, South Dakota Habitat Fund was initiated through the legislature, and and uh, funds were going to the Precision Ag, and it's like we got to get this together and figure out how do you combine these two things, and that's really what what if you could dream up something, how would you do that? And that's really where the three of us kind of brainstormed. There was other people involved. Uh, but just thinking, how can you put a precision approach to conservation as well as agriculture? And I think that's really where it started. Yeah. And also your background, that whole, the idea that conservation pays. I mean, there's a, there's a place for conservation that is profitable for producers. We always talked about it. You know through programs and through just taking some of that marginal land out of production, we gotta be helping their bottom line. But nobody ever put pencil to paper and understood what that really was. Um, so this was another way when, when we, all these discussions happened was, you know, we can finally look at what are those impacts of conservation on the, that producer's day-to-dayness. Um, and not just the federal government and the taxpayers, but what does it mean for that producer on the ground who's putting his kid through school and raising families? Does it truly pay for them like we think it does? And this was a good way to look at that and get some actual data that shows that. There was some great software that had been developed to help do that mm -hmm. and, and create you know, some really good data sets where we could take a look at this. And no one was doing that. No one was recording you know, this return per acre type analysis and comparing that with a conservation analysis. And really, it's the same analysis. It's, it's inputs and outputs, and, and we combined all that into this. So record, the effort recorded or helped fund some of that work so we could do that, and then, and then to talk about it like we're doing today, what did we find out? And that's still you know, evolving. Yeah, and to, I guess, elaborate on that further, I'm a big believer in we're all in this together. Okay. And you know, growing up throughout the, the wildlife conservation community, I'd always see the conservation community over here, and I always see agriculture over here. And I kept telling myself it doesn't need to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. It can't be that way. Right. We gotta bring them together because they ultimately have the same goal. 
Farmers and ranchers are the best stewards of those lands because they have to be. If they're not, they're not going to keep being in business for much longer, which ultimately then benefits the conservation aspects of it. So that's what really drove me then to this concept of how do we bring them together. And ultimately it comes down to making sure they're profitable and making sure that they're, they have the tools in the toolbox, the analytical analysis, the precision data, all of that to make those financial decisions that one, take those marginal row crops out of production and then obviously put some of those marginal row crops in, into, mar, in, into perennial grass, incorporating that working lands component. So I think we're getting there, I really do. I really think that we're bridging that gap and that, that was the ultimate goal in my mind is to bring those two groups together and to build those relationships and to find the common good in what we're all in this for. And that there's, there is a common good in all of this for sure. I really, I've been around for the, actively involved with this for over 20 years and Kevin's spot on. I feel like those two groups have gotten together like I've never seen it before. Um, that's been really fun to watch that transition and watching not like that we're here and here and it's more we're, we're together now and that right. understanding that and I think you know, this effort plays a big role in that that everybody's understanding that we're in this together and fighting gets us nowhere. You've all been working in this this area your whole career. Um, you've seen lots of things come and go and we, we just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the programs and the approaches uh, to this issue and discuss a little bit about those and then kind of circle back to what you just mentioned about that 20 acres and that 160 and, and get back to that point. So what, what have you seen in, in your careers uh, that hasn't worked and that has worked? Yeah, it's, you know, it's the, especially on the federal side, it's constantly evolving and it's a big album that suit um, that gets pr producers really confused a lot of times. Um, but you know, there's a lot of programs that you know, you've talked about, CRP. Um, that program's always worked really well. It's been around for 40 years. Um, the nice thing about CRP is it continues to evolve, um, you know, incorporating livestock into it more and more, um, getting different practices under the program that meet specific needs within areas. Um, the safe, program, safe practice under CRP was a big thing for our state. Um, it allowed us to tailor a program within CRP that we could put acres in that made sense and had a lot of flexibility in it. Um, so that program's really evolved over the years. And then with over time with NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, sorry to throw a bunch of acronyms out there, but okay. um, you know, they have EQIP, that, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program that is out there that offers really good cost share. Um, and these things keep cha adding and changing um, all the time. Um, so I think you know on the federal side, all the agencies are looking at what they can do. But I, I like Kevin's point that we need to get away from that and being so de or dependent on federal programs because they come and go. Um, but it does make sense to, in some of these areas to do perennials and conservation all the time without the programs. Okay. That would add that it, it's not always a program either. That I think you know you can you can. Um, come to the right answer on an acre, it should be uh, the same answer for everybody that looks at it, whether it's conservation, whether it's production, whether it's uh, insurance, what, whatever angle you come at it, there should be a right answer. And I think we're trying to get to that answer. And, uh, you know, if, if we're not looking at really what's driving it is the health of the soil and the capability of that soil to function the way it to it to its best potential. Then we haven't found the right answer just yet. So, I think that's where we're headed, and 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 programs are starting to reflect that a little bit more and more. Instead of saying, "Well, you're you're leaving the farmer with a choice. I'm going to go with CRP or I'm going to farm it," and we aren't getting to quite the right answer there. Neither one of those was was really what was going to be the win for him. He, it's something yeah. in between there. Well, the tools in the toolbox have expanded. I mean, we're talking a lot more about no-till. We're talking a lot more about putting cattle back on the landscape, cover crops, you know, having that diversity in a farm and ranch operation. Um, I'm a cow guy, so I'll talk about cows all day long and, and cattle and how to incorporate that into, into that farm and ranch and making that farm and ranch more profitable with cattle. So that's another tool that you know we rely heavily upon to influence that soil health component. 
and uh, we're, we're eager to continue those conversations and look at how that piece of it then does benefit the bottom line. This is all about profitability. It has to be. A farm and ranch family has to remain profitable in order to continue that business. And if they're not, it's going to fold, and we all recognize that. And we're committed to helping those folks become more profitable throughout these practices and help, you know, helping them make those financial decisions using these you know, data sets that Every Acre Counts is working on. So you all just really worked around the next thing that I want to talk about very well, and, and you guys do that very well, and that's this working lands concept. You mentioned the profitability. You mentioned the answer to soil health. You mentioned the, the, the other programs and the, and, the, and the effect on the wildlife. And so it has to be a working lands concept. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so let's just talk about, about what that means for the, for the people that don't quite understand Stand that concept. Just add add a few comments about that, if you will. And you know, it stepping back 30, 40 years, we all felt like you plant grass on an area and you walk away from it and let that grass do its thing. Um, over time, we've learned through research and other things that that's like the worst thing you can do for habitat and for, for the grasses and forbs that you're planting. Um, you need things like livestock in the system, um, and and so as the programs evolve and people have talked, it's um, that idea of letting a land sit idle, we know it's not a valid thing to do. We have to have cattle on the landscape making it work, because um, that's how it, it benefits, and that's how that, those systems are healthy. So um, yeah, working lands, is, 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 it's kind of evolved as that perfect, perfect approach, because the producer's getting more income because he's still got livestock on there, um, or he's producing hay on it. Um, during the right times of the year and things like that. So it's working for him, it's working for wildlife. Um, yeah, the working lands concept has continued to evolve and has shown to be a win-win for everybody. Yeah, yeah it, and, and, and within that, some flexibility as well. Things like haying come into play. You know, it, it's, a, it's a potential return on that acre that that farmer owns, he's paying taxes on it. You can't just, uh, not have that acre produce something and it could be wildlife value it could be aesthetics it could be a great wetland a nice you know area to to just enjoy but it also could be uh, you know producing some hay from time to time or, or, or rented to a neighbor to bring his livestock in to, to graze that area uh, even if the landowner doesn't own livestock there's there's other solutions within that and cover crops and other things can come into play as well to help heal that soil. And there's been options, you know, that aren't so long term. And I think that really helps the producer with the flexibility aspects. A five-year commitment versus a 15-year commitment. Correct. You know, making sure that those options are on the table for those producers is critical. Because as you know, as everybody knows, commodities ebb and flow. I mean, and it's constant. They're up and down all the time. We've seen it in the last six months, especially once again. So. Having that flexibility, having those opportunities to hay, graze, you know, cover crops, doing all those things that aren't just either row crops or aren't just set aside grass. I mean, that's something that I have really embraced over the years is that working lands component, and I think it's the way. I really do. The, fit, the way of the future for sure when it comes to profitability. Absolutely. You hit on it a little bit, Kevin. We like to focus in on the livestock end of it. But even on the row crop side, you know, incorporating cover crops and having something green growing on it year round, um, which is benefiting, you know, it's, it's working land, I mean, it's working all year at that point um, and benefiting the soil health. That also has really positive impacts for wildlife too. So it's not, you know, I like to always dial in, I'm, I'm like Kevin, I'm a cattle guy, I like cattle, but working lands also incorporates into row crop acres as well. Um, the answer is there, so. So we're all excited about Every Acre Counts. Yeah. It's a great, great program. Um, but let's just think about the future now. We kind of came from the past, developed a foundation, talked about some of the issues, talked about how to solve them, and now the Every Acre Counts program, and it, it really has got, got the wheels on the bus and the bus can drive. What does the future look like? Let, let's just think about if, 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 if a huge portion of the marginal lands we're in a conservation type program. What would that do for pheasants and quail? Matt, on your end. What would that do for South Dakota corn and corn growers and commodity growers in general? And what would that do 
for habitat and, and all the folks that work for you, Kevin, we're not focusing on, ha on habitat anymore. Can they do other things that, that you just think about but never have time to do? I guess that's kind of what I want to I want, I want to go. So any one of you, if, if, if you're ready to, to answer that question or frame that question, go, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I can go on forever on this topic because I love and dream. Um, yeah. And you know, where, where, I, where I really see this going is, you know, producers are understanding that there's room for conservation of their land, which is to put more habitat in the ground. We're going to see more pheasants, more quail, more deer, more ducks. Um, on the landscape conversely from that and you know so we spend a lot of time talking about the farmers profitability so they're gonna have more money um, they're gonna be happier um, but also those rural communities are gonna be more happier because as you have more wildlife populations more pheasants and, and grouse and quail and stuff more hunters show up from out of state from other urban areas um, that means more money in those rural communities um, Nothing's better to me than opening morning of pheasant season on Main Street, small town, whether it's Westington Springs or Lemon or wherever, and seeing a bunch of hunters out there spending money in the community. Um, I know a lot of folks like to complain about our state license plates, but seeing them lined on Main Street, that means more money coming into our state and more money being spent in the cafes and the hotels. Um, and that's just the world I want to be in. I really feel like this gets us to that point. Um, I really see it's, it's going to happen. Um, it's happening now. I mean, we're seeing more and more opening weekend hunters, more out state people showing up. That's more money in those communities. Um, I had a conversation way back when with a, a restaurant owner in a small town, and he made the comment that it's because of pheasant hunters that are in there for a couple months out of the year that he's able to stay open the rest of the year and serve his community. Um, but sadly, we see a lot more of them not making it than making it sometimes. And, through efforts like this, I think we'll see more vibrant main streets. Um, so for you, it's community development. It's community development. I really, you know, I don't talk a lot about pheasants and quail anymore. I talk about rural communities and strong rural communities because I know that pheasants and quail will come from that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just there'll be more among the landscape. So. Very good. Okay. Jim? Well, I'll dream a little as well. Um, I, I think it would be just fantastic if like I said earlier, the answer was the same from everyone that the farmer was going to for advice, whether it's his agronomist, his crop insurance agent, the NRCS, wherever he's going for, to for advice, instead of getting three different answers, right. precision points to one. So why can't every acre counts be available for every farmer or anybody that wants it? And I, I think it is. So it, it just needs to be supported so we can get to that point where people are comfortable, the bank is comfortable, the insurance companies are in support and comfortable, and the agronomy around that is comfortable because it's about serving the farmer and his needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think it expands. That's what I'd like to see is a, is a huge expansion to where it's just part of our daily business. This is how we do it now. Yeah. Okay. Kevin. Yeah, I mean, for me, it ties back to the department's mission, um, enhancing the quality of life for current and future generations. And, uh, you know, our mission, again, within the department is centric to this effort within Every Acre Counts, serving and connecting people and families to the outdoors. And the reason it's centric to this effort with Every Acre Counts is the fact that if we don't have producers managing those lands and taking care of those lands, we don't have wildlife. I mean, ultimately, we raise and grow those wildlife on private lands. We're 80% privately owned across this state, at least 80%. So that it, it's a partnership that has to occur, and we have to work with our producers every way we can. Uh, agriculture is, is so critical, and it's, it's a, a very important industry within South Dakota, and it is. It, it's all about that quality of life piece of it for not just now, but 100 years from now. And I can't stress that enough. I have two four-year-olds and a two-year-old at home. I want to ensure that they have the opportunities to hunt and fish and recreate in the outdoors like I do, you know, I do today. And I want to make sure that their kids do as well. Um, one of the things that we always talk about is the fact that what would South Dakota be like if we didn't have those outdoor recreational opportunities, right? 25% mm -hmm. of people that live in the state hold a hunting license. We're the highest per capita wow. say, hunting sales uh, in the nation per person. And uh, that's a really cool statistic to be proud of. 
we love our outdoor heritage here in South Dakota, and I want to carry that on to future generations, and this is a big part of that. Great. Okay, we, we've been having an awesome discussion today about Every Acre Counts, and, and we talked about the idea and how, how the foundation was laid and the importance of, of, of bringing all these messages together. But we, we really need to talk about who really helped you know, make this happen. And, and there's been a number of different entities uh, that have come together, working together. And uh, Matt, you're, you're going to cover your side of things. Yep, so for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, um, we received a very generous gift from Nestle Purina a few years ago. Um, they're looking at their sustainability and having impacts on soil health through their supply chains. Um, and so you know, they gave us the money with a lot of loose strings on it. Um, but you know, this was right as Every Acre Counts was taking off. Um, and it just really seemed like a logical place for, to use their funds um, to be invested in this program, bring on staff to help out with the program, make sure it succeeds. Um, so yeah, you know, we had, we were kind of a pass through in that, you know, we got some corporate dollars from Nestle Purina, um, and this was just the perfect place to land it um, and support it. Um, being an NGO, we don't have a lot of free cash laying around, so that's how it works for us. We, uh, we find money from one place and send it to where it needs to go. So, um, you know, without the help of Nestle Purina, um, it would have been a different story for us just because we wouldn't have had the funds, so. Yeah, and your role in the Every Acre program is, 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 is really vital because you provide that technical part of that program through that grant funding, and, and that's really the, the work that needs to be done. Right. Yep. We saw a need there that you know, getting the analyses done and talking to those producers about what those analyses mean um, was something we really, that, there was a niche there for us, and that's something that we've, we do across the country with other programs. Um, so it was just a logical fit for us, yeah. And you wouldn't necessarily think of pheasants and quail forever as a precision farming entity, but you've really applied that to, to your program. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of goes back to that. You know, pheasants forever and quail forever, to be philosophical, we love rural America. Um, and, and that precision egg plays into it. And like Kevin said, we're all in it together. And that's the perfect nexus when those those fears come together and precision egg really drives that. And it's become a big focus for our company with our precision egg and conservation specialists and, and the overall mm -hmm. push towards using that data that's floating out there and putting it to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Jim, you represent South Dakota Corn as well as, as USDA NRCS. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be here today talking about this if it wasn't for that uh, vision of leadership, of trying to find that common mission between USDA and the commodity organization. So this was kind of a innovative partnership that was developed where uh, a director of sustainability was working for a co commodity organization. And with that, I was able to bring in some of the stuff that Matt and I had been working on and trying to find also common mission. And, uh, and, and South Dakota Corn stepped to the plate and you know helped bring the salinity issue out to the forefront, help pay for some of the research, and then the Every Acre Counts program, we've been in support of that primi primarily with, with my involvement. And uh, uh, NRCS then has, from that side of it, they've been in full support um, bringing in that uh, ability to use some of the technical service that they provide through their staff to help uh, address these acres and to do the right thing once we decide we're going to do something a little different. So NRCS has been a huge partner in this and continues to be and uh, uh, so it's a good relationship. And Kevin, um, obviously GFNP is your passion and, and, and then the Second Century Habitat Fund, to try to bring those two groups into this. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So the second century, and what that stands for is, you know, we hit our 100th year pheasant season anniversary in 2019. So we want to ensure the next 100 years were as good as the last when it comes to pheasant hunting, our hunting tradition in South Dakota, the quality of life piece we talked about. And this was a part of that, um, ensuring that, you know, we continue looking at new ways to put grass on the landscape, uh, continue to look at new ways to enroll more working lands, especially our five-year uh, working lands program that Second Century is a big part of and uh, ensuring that we have that opportunity to be flexible and nimble with producers to you know, allow a five-year commitment with haying and grazing as well. Um, and that's where we came into play is, is we've seen the, 
this benefiting those practices, we've seen how identifying those acres was going to essentially get more land enrolled in that working lands program, and it has. It definitely has. Um, it's contributed to uh, moving that needle, if you will, and that's where the department's very invested, is to making sure that there's programs out there that are, one, um, you know, feasible to operate or feasible for the producer to implement, but two, also profitable for the producer. And uh, we feel like this is a great fit for that. And yeah, the department's committed and I'm um, excited about this. Again, bringing conservation and agriculture together and that's what this is all about. Absolutely, thank you. And I just wanna personally thank you all for, all three of you for coming today. I know it was very hard to put this into your schedules and, and uh, it was just good to get the group back together again and, ha and have a really great discussion about our common efforts in the Every Acre Counts program. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anthony. Thank you. We appreciate Thanks it. for everything.